How is everyone feeling? High energy? Yes, yes Dan! <laughs> I've told you to say yes, Dan. You don't know who I am yet. So, we should probably kick off. So that means I need to set the start button. Right. So, my name's Dan Brown, or Kanban Dan. Nice to meet you all if I haven't met you before. And this is my good colleague. So, uh, yeah, I'm Duncan Smith. Um, I'm a scrum master at ASOS.com. Um, yeah. And we had to do it in the game. Well, it's in the game. So, yeah, I'm a agile and Kanban coach and trainer. I work with a company called Ripper Rock, um, who did some work at ASOS as well. And, yeah, we want to talk to you about using gameplay to help you learn. And it does kind of relate back to what the keynote was around about this morning. So when David was talking about actually taking the thing to, you know, using the fight rather than using a kata. So it's kind of like actually doing something and learning that way rather than just reading a book. So I hand over the wand of power. Duncan. Excellent. OK, so we've done that. OK, so um, we're going to play a game in a minute um, created by um, Henrik Nieberg. Um, it's called The Name Game. So first of all, if, if you've done this before, can you just kind of keep stum on it? Um, don't spoil it for the others. We're trying to get some learning out of it first and foremost. So just play along, be, be good, and, um, uh, and we'll, we'll go from there. Yeah. OK, so um, first of all, how long do we think it takes to write a name? So this is a, a four name on a six by four index card with a, a big fat pen. How long do we think? Three seconds. Three seconds. Anyone else? Ten seconds. Ten seconds. So okay. I'm hearing three, ten. Any advance? Everyone happy if I jump in the middle of that and say, what, five? This is an interactive session. You're going to have to talk. <laughs> yes, Dan. <laughs> Five seconds. Are you happy if I force that on you now? Okay. 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 Five seconds. So, how long do we think for five names? Twenty-five. So, five times the, the number for one name. Okay. Are we all happy with that? They're, they're going to be arbitrary lengths, aren't they? But they're going to be around probably four to ten letters, I would say. Yeah. I would say three is your minimum and 15 is your maximum on a first name. Yeah, let's parameterize it. OK, so, so we've got 25 seconds for five names. And what factors do we think are going to actually affect that, that timing to write five names? Mm -hmm. Anything else? Of I'm sorry? Availability of cards. I'm going to put cards, pens as material. OK? Anything else? I'm sorry? What hand you can use? Which hand? <laughs> That's a new one on me. How about length of name? That came up earlier. Shall I put that in? Yeah. Spelling? Yeah. Anything else you think? And there's a glaring omission here. Memory. 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 Okay. OK, great. So um, we've got some factors out. We're going to go and play a game now to go and explore some of these factors, maybe, and how they affect um, the time that it takes us to write these five names out. So um, before we start, can you just all take your name badges off? Because that will affect things a little bit. OK, so um, we need to split up into some teams. So um, could we get into teams of six, first of all, please? Just bunch around in sixes.
okay? Yes, mustn't stand in front of the slide there. No, I know. <laughs> We've got to confuse the hell out of them by making both sides, actually. <laughs> the camera will be flipping between us. Six there, six one. So we've got six groups of six ish. Okay. Okay. So um, in your groups, you're going to need a developer. So can someone in each group nominate themselves as the developer? Okay. Okay. All good? Okay, so the rest of you are going to be customers as well for the developer, feeding them work. Um, we need everyone to have, um, or all of the customers to have a card, everyone to have a pen. We all good? Yeah. Okay. okay, good stuff. So, we'll go into the rules. So, for customers, you just need to hand the developer your card and tell them your name. And the developer's then going to write the name on the card and hand it back to you, and you're going to capture the time that you get the card back when it's completed. Now, yes. if the name is wrong, then don't accept it, hand it back, and correct the error. Um, the developer's free to ask you questions, so if he's unsure of the spelling, then, then spell the name for them, but you just cannot write anything down. Okay. Okay. Make sure you do write down the time as shown on the screen when you get the card back and you're happy with it. That's really important because we've got to use real metrics. Yep. So, so we'll have a stopwatch up here. So it's the time that the, that's going to start at zero um, and yeah, the time that it shows on the stopwatch when you get it back. Okay. Okay. So, developers. Yeah, developers, we've, um, we've got a corporate policy here, but we believe that the sooner you start something, the sooner you finish it. We're not to keep the customers waiting, so if there's a customer there, you're to take their card and start working on it immediately. Okay? Yeah. So when I say go, you're to write, take the first card and write the first letter of that name, take the second card, write the, set of the first letter of that name, and so on until you've completed each card. Does that make sense? If you've ever worked in a digital agency, you know this is exactly the business model most digital agencies work with. Get as many customers as you can at once, start them all at once, and keep showing them progress at the weekly meetings when they come and visit you. So it's the same thing. We're working on everything at once and showing progress on everything. Yeah? So, before we say go, do all the customers know what they need to do? Any questions? It's the Just the first name. They'll tell you what they want. Developers, any questions? Okay? Okay. Let's go. And... Ready? Go! What's that? Yeah.
Tell us when you're done. <laughs> okay. Okay, gang, let me just pad shamelessly while I draw a quick chart. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the times back from each of you, because there's just six groups, and in that way we can actually get everybody's data and see what's going on. So I'm going to assign you team names. And because I just feel like it, you guys are team A. Right, so could you tell me your, I guess you've got four people who are customers, your four customer times. So if you just shout them out at me, I'll write them down. Sorry, how long? Oh, actually, while you're all doing this, can you convert your times to seconds in your brain rather than minutes and seconds? That way we can see comparison easier. You've got to keep the units consistent. So, so at 95, 97, 97 90, yes? Yeah? Um, okay, so considerably higher than the 25 second estimate. Just, I thought I'd point that out as we go through. Team B, is that team there? So if you could give me your times the same way, please. We haven't finished even one thing, so. <laughs> <laughs> so you haven't got any times for me? No. <sighs> See me after school. Team C. Team D, that group in the middle there. Do I miss one? Oh no, you're a five as well, okay. Team behind our Team E, welcome. How many? God, you've got short names, okay. 45. Sorry, what was the last one? 43. And Team F. Sixty-two. Okay, so I, th I think we can see that 25 seconds may have been a bit optimistic as our estimate. So I'm afraid there's a bit of bad news. As you can imagine, printing cards, you know, and little name cards, a volume business, we really have to make our targets. So I'm afraid developers, you're all sacked. We're out of business. Good news is, we're that kind of company that just resets ourselves up immediately, so we've got a new business. So, we're all hiring developers. So could each of the developers move around one team? So A go to B, B go to C, C to D, and so on. So if you could just quickly swap seats, just the developers. Come on, hurry up, it's your first day in the office. Can't be late. Okay. Should we have gone with the factors? We'll come to that next. Okay, have we all found our groups? Has every team got a developer? Okay, so if I can just rewind us ever so slightly. A little earlier, we asked you for all the factors that were going to affect your estimate.
Can I just ask, out of all the things that you've told me, which one made it that, on average, you were well over 100% out on your estimate? Was it the language? Character set? Material? Which hand you had to write with? Nice thinking, though. I liked it. You saw there was a game coming. Was it the length of name? Spelling? Hmm. Memory? Font? Or can I suggest it might have been? Pardon? The process or the system of work. In fact, task switching. All the time the developer had to switch from one task to the next task to the next task. Where am I in this name? What letter comes next with this name? And this person I've never met before. It's actually worse if it's people you know because when you're in distress, you start forgetting people's names who you work with every day and it gets embarrassing. But I'm just going to write that down. Has anyone heard the fable that women are better at multitasking than men? Well, actually, it's not. Um, Carbon-based life forms, to pick on David Anderson's terminology, carbon-based life forms cannot multitask. Full stop, period. It is impossible. Your brain does not work that way. I've been doing a lot of reading into cognitive neuroscience. It's really interesting. What you actually do is exactly the same as a computer does to multiprocess. You task switch. You switch from one thing to the other. And empirically, women are slightly better at task switching than men are. However, what I would like to point out is that's like saying this group of people are slightly better at shooting themselves in the foot than that group of people. The real answer would be to look at the system of work, change the system of work, and see if we can't sh avoid shooting ourselves in the foot at all. So, with that in mind, we are going to run the game again. But this time, we're going to do things just a bit different. Customers, don't do anything differently. The reason we say that is, in real life, if you're a digital agency, your customers are going to act the way your customers act. It's really hard to change people internally, but trying to change your customers is really difficult. So you're going to do nothing different. When we say go, we're going to say, here's my card, and this is my name. Completely as if the other people, the other customers don't exist. Because why would we tell our customers that we're working for multiple customers at once, right? So just treat them all exactly as you did, yeah? You just give over your card, say your name. At the end of it, write down the time. However, we've had a consultant in. And he wore a white tag. I had to take mine off for the microphone. So he's told us, actually, the sooner you start, the sooner you finish, does not work. It doesn't not work in general of, I'm saying so in Kanban. The human being, his brain, likes to think of cause and effect. Starting something does not cause something to finish. The sooner you finish, the sooner you finish. That's cause and effect. The act of finishing something causes something to be finished. So, with that in mind, we have a new developer policy, a new best practice. So this time, developers, when we say go, you're going to take the first card and finish it. Then you're going to take the second card and finish it. Third card, fourth card, fifth card. You'll finish them one at a time and hand them back as soon as they are done. Anyone got any questions? about the game. We all understand what we're going to do. Groovy. In which case, we're going to sneak back to here. Wait for it. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, look at that. It's all gone horribly wrong. We'll just have to sneak it in the second way. This one here, yeah, that one. Are you all ready? 
I've given you plenty of time now. Three, two, one, go. So we play it by Could you stick your hand up if your table's finished? See one table working still. Okay, I think everyone's done, yes? Did it come out of the video? <laughs> oh, you come out and present it. Okay, if we can stop the music. I feel like a hairy banker on Strictly Come Dancing. That's only for the UK audience. Okay, can we go through and get the results again? If we can have table A. And one, sorry, what was the other one? Only four customers. We've lost one. Oh no. All right, okay, I, I wrote down wrong. Okay, I'll take that as a user error. Table B, did you get some times this time? Yeah. Nine. Somebody got his name wrong. <laughs> yeah, Polish, was it one language, I guess. Table C. Sounds like there's a bug on that table. Table D. Sorry? Okay, table E. And last but definitely not least, the wonderful table F. Six. Six. You have a question? No, you didn't. No, you still start the time when you start the time and you finish it when you finish it. And that's important actually. So can I point you at these numbers? Each time we've got a first run and a second run. Can I point out, well one, the, if we've got a median time here, it's kind of like there, whereas here it's kind of like there, those two there. It's hard to say on that one, though, although the median's easy. Um, median time. So, what do you see about these numbers on the first run? If you look at each table's own set of numbers. They are predictable, although we didn't predict it very well. <laughs> Just shows that's another lesson we can learn about estimation versus actually doing. All of the value is released in batches at the end. So if you look at this example, no value at all till 70 seconds in, pretty much. Whereas if we look the other time through, 2, 5, 7, 8, 23, 6, 10, 14, 21, 26, we have a regular heartbeat of value coming out of the system. It also kind of bears witness that this way through, the very last card was done before the very first card was done on the original way, 
and multitasking. Now, I'm prepared to guess that everybody here is an intelligent human being in carbon-based life form, therefore knows working on multiple things at once is slower than working on one thing at a time, focusing it. Yeah, I'm also willing to guess, unless you've played a game like this before, you've never bothered to do the maths and see the real numbers and see the impact. So, developers, how were you in the first one? How did it feel doing that job? Stressful, intimidating. Anything else? Yeah. Frustrating. Compare that with version two, when you've got to finish and focus on it one whole name at a time. How, was that, how did that feel for you? Did it feel better, worse? The same? Mm -hmm. Did you get more bugs? First time through or second time through? It's interesting because in this game, actually, you sometimes see a lot of bugs in version two because you feel like you should be doing better on version two, therefore, you really rush ahead. So, I think it's clear to see that from this game, you have shown me with your data that it's faster to finish one thing at a time and you will get through to the end much faster than if you do things multiple times, multiple at a time. Is that a fair conclusion to draw? There were the same number of strokes of pen on card. Yeah? Exactly the same value work was done in both methods. But using this method, a lot more effort was needed because that person was occupied and fully utilized both ways through. Yeah? Yes, Dan. And it, it was, as well on the first time, it's likely to be more work for the customer as well because you kind of, every time you get to, to write on a card, you have to go back and say, you know, what, what's the name again? Because you, you're not going to remember those five names all going around your head at one time. So it's also going to be work there that we don't capture mm -hmm. on their part, and that's going to annoy them, right? They're, they're kind of having to answer the same question over and over again. I think it's also worth thinking, if you were the last customer on route two, if you were this 26 seconds person on this table here, so how did that feel, seeing nothing happening on your work for all that time? It, it, it's kind of weird if you're a customer, or a customer and nobody's working on your thing, then suddenly everybody's working on it and you're 100% focused on the work too. And this is, again, a Kanban learning we can take. We talk about that initial commit point at the start of lead time, if you remember David Anderson's keynote this morning. And that's a two-way commit. It's not just a commit of, we're going to do your stuff now that you asked for. It's a, and now you need to commit to work with us and to actually want the thing you've asked for. So it's worth thinking about that and actually making sure the customer's along for the ride. Because it can feel really weird when 22 seconds in, nothing's happened. OK, so. The slide deck's working again, hooray. So what did we learn? Anyone got any thoughts they want to share? We learned that work, limiting work in progress really helps. We did? Limiting whip? <coughs> I've, I've got to say, I'll, I'll be honest. My honesty gene's kicking in. This isn't the benefit you necessarily get from limiting work in progress. This is just getting rid of the first part of multitasking. There's a huge benefit to that. There's more benefit to limiting work in progress than is shown in this game. You are needfully doing something very simple. It is a bit of a kata rather than actually fighting somebody. It's kind of like you're doing sparring and it's semi-contact, so if they punch you in the face, it doesn't hurt so much in your judo. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. So, and actually this is also worth pointing out, we have led you with a consultant giving you an answer to the way you should do things. Again, this isn't necessarily something that's real. So bear in mind, all of these examples that you'll lose like this, they're there to be learning tools. But let's move on to why did that work as a game? Why is it more valuable that we played the game 
than that we just, I could have said. If you limit your work in progress, you'll do it probably about a third as quick. You know, the estimates will probably be suddenly correct and you'll be much faster. Why did it work that you did it? Anyone got any thoughts? What am I doing? Sorry? Doing it, experiencing it. Yeah, you actually experience it. Yeah. So there's a cognitive belief engine that goes on in your brain. What that basically does is it looks at your, some of your experiences that you've ever had and applies that to what you've seen or done. So if I tell you something, the thing you hear will be the same set of words as I tell the person sitting next to you, but you might actually get a different thing going on in your brain because of your experiences to this. Whereas by playing a game, I'm not telling you something, you're experiencing it and you're seeing what actually happens. So I, I just want to try this with you. I'm going to ask you all to figuratively close your eyes and picture the thing in your brain based on the two words I'm about to tell you. You ready? The two words are old, bat. Hands up if you're picturing some sort of sporting tool. Hands up if you're picturing something that flies and maybe sucks blood. Hands up if you're picturing somebody you didn't really like who was a female teacher or something in your past life. <laughs> so when we're taught words, we associate based on our own experiences. Even twins will have different thoughts based on their experiences because their experiences will be different, even though they are genetically identical. So we need to actually give people more than just some words. We need to give them some experiences that will help them learn from. I think it, it's right. It, um, as well, who felt that they could relate to, to this, this sort of slightly abstract game? Um, could you map that to stuff which happens in your working life or even your, your personal life? I mean, did, did it help to do that more than maybe a textbook or some literature or a lecture? Um, would do. Yeah, I think it's a really nice simple exercise. I'll probably go back and do this with my clients. Yeah. Yeah, I should, we, we did mention earlier, there was a sound going, it's Henrik Kneiberg's game, or Kneiberg, or... Uh, pronunciation is not my forte in his name. However, if you Google it, how long does it take to write a name, you'll find that it's open source Creative Commons. So please do, it's a very useful tool to get people to learn. But the, and there are lots of other learning games that will bring out different anticipations and different things. The way I like to use them when I'm training is I like to play a game with people to introduce the concepts, to start the juices flowing, the learning that's going on in your brain. Now we know that something's going on, then I'll try and layer in the theory behind it, and then on top of that I'll put in the application of how we do this in our real job. So if you've got a team where the whip is high and people are multitasking, and you've got one person who just really has to take in five cards at any given time, you play with this with them, and they suddenly feel a bit, hmm, perhaps I need to think about the way I work. Now, this is a simple example. Remember earlier the, the Knevin model was put up for complexity? Most of the work we're actually doing is in the complex adaptive space, and this is simple. Writing names. You've been training your entire life to write these names on a card. So I've, I've had that benefit, but in your real work, where you're actually, if you're a software developer, writing code, if you're a marketer, marketeer, if you're actually coming to a, a marketing program and the world keeps changing because someone else has put a different market advertising up in your area and, and the world's changed a little bit, these are cognitive things and it's, the impact of working in progress like this is actually much higher, it's much worse if you try and multitask with cognitive work. How many times have you been in the middle of solving a problem at your desk, just going through some real nutty, horrible problem, and someone rings the phone and you answer it and go, where was I? What was I thinking? That's all this cognitive waste you're going to have. So, we can learn it that way. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting point. I mean, if you think where we actually do most of our effective thinking, you know, when, when do we have the ideas? When do we have the creative sparks? You know, where, well, you tell me, where, where do you do that thinking? I'm going to say it's on it, the toilet. 
Yeah, I mean, that's it. Me. Is it. Is it sat at your desk reading emails? Is it sat at a board table? Most likely it's not. I mean, certainly I don't find that. Um, and your brain actually shuts down. It, it restricts your creativity. It restricts your ability to take in knowledge. And it's, it's tr by using games, we can kind of put the brain or switch the brain back on and allow us to start using it effectively rather than it get shut down and you go into the sort of the, the anger, the stress, the, the adrenaline, the uh, fight or flight mode. Games take you away from that. And so I, I guess there was a few smiles going on there, some laughter and you know, movement and interacting with people. All of yeah. these things help to open the brain up. And so games are really, really effective at doing that. Yeah, and I think there's, there's something more to it. There's all of the studies that have ever been done will tell you that if you have a class full of kids and you want them to learn effectively for the next hour when they're doing their maths, get them to get up and get active for two minutes first, and all of a sudden, they will learn better. It also tells us that every study ever been done will tell us that lecture is the least effective form of training there is for retention. And at the end of the day, you've got to think about what the outcome of any session at a conference, lesson, training, class, anything you do. The outcome isn't that I, as a trainer, for example, feel good that I have trained well. That, that's not the outcome that matters. The outcome that matters is the retained learning in the people who have attended. So if the outcome of something you're trying to get across is retained learning, then look for something experience, experiential, something kinesthetic, something that's going to get people active and actually the blood flowing through their body and get them into it. And you should end up with a better outcome of learning for the people you're training. Duncan. Okay, so um, we're saying games are effective learning tools, right? Well, it's more than that. You know, how many of us attend stand-up meetings every day? I'd say probably quite a large chunk of the room, right? Yeah. Okay, so... You know, stand-ups are a bit of a buzzword, a bit trendy, but there, there is a meaning to it, you know, getting us out of our, our place, away from emails, things that shut us down, get us on our feet, get us moving. They, they start to open the, the uh, brain up. It helps us to listen. It helps us to, to connect things, solve problems. Um, so, you know, there's a real reason for it. And this can be branched out into... Uh, sort of all sorts of areas. So facilitation. Um, I recently spent some time with Paul Goddard. Um, he does some workshops on, on using improv techniques, um, sort of in, in the workplace, to, to aid facilitation. And, and once again, it takes people out of their comfort zone. It allows them to, to open their mind up so that they can, they can work through ideas. They're, they're not just suppressing them down. They, they can take in learning. Um, and finally, it can be used in really diverse areas. So there's a, a playwright, a Brazilian playwright, uh, called Augusto Boll. Um, and he, for probably 40, 50 years, has been running um, these workshops called the Theatre of the Oppressed. Um, and they're really a mechanism to um, engineer social change. Um, and so they'll typically run in communities where there's a lot of... Um, so sort of disintegration and um, social conflict. And they'll invite the community in and they'll have a set of players who will act out a, um, a scenario and the audience will, will watch it through. And then they run through it again. Um, only the audience participate this time and they change the outcome. So it gets some understanding, it gets them working together. And games play a big part in those workshops. He runs sort of extensive warm-up routines, which, um, you know, if any of you are trying to facilitate, they're great for using at the start of meetings. Um, and they're all designed to take people out of their comfort zone, to get them moving, to get them working together, laughing, smiling, and opening up their brains. Okay. So what you've probably noticed in this room, and it's very, very visible if you're standing in this part of the room particularly, is the first half of this session Everyone's kind of getting into it. There's a lot of noise. People are talking and chatting on and asking questions of each other. Second half has been a bit more lectury, hasn't it? So I'm now actually saying, how did that feel? Remember the first half, remember the second half. Remember the difference. You know, 
in the first half, no one was leaning on their hands. I've got to say, there's a lot of that. No one was like. So, does anyone have any questions? Because I think we're, we're done lecturing. One for you, Duncan. Yeah, so um, I mean, if you have a look for Paul, um, Paul Goddard, um, he's written a couple of blogs on it, I think, as well. Um, and basically, they're, they're pretty standard improv um, exercises that, that he uses. So um, if you go onto YouTube and look for the comedy store or, or just improv in general, those exercises. So it can be um, things like, I mean, they, they have a game called Three Headed Expert, which I think is quite quite a sort of standard improv game. And it's where you have someone asking questions of this three-headed expert, so three people answering. And they answer a word at a time, OK? And so he'll ask a question. They'll, they'll go along until they get something like a reasonable answer. And so it, those sorts of things are quite effective, I find, in, in retrospectives, maybe, or um, that sort of thing, to just try and get a, a broader look, Chevy, Chevy sort of input into the meeting. Um, and also, no one quite knows where it's going. So you, you can't have one person driving the agenda. Um, but there's, there's hundreds of them out there. Just be creative on how you, how you incorporate them and where you can find a use. And if you're see, sitting there thinking, yeah, but this is a bit soft. I'm never going to take that and use it in my retrospectives. What I would challenge you to do right now is try it. See it. See if it works for you. Give it a go. The worst that can happen is it didn't quite work out but at least you've done a bit of team bonding while it didn't quite work out. So give these things a go, try it, apply it, try and see how it works in your context, make it happen. What's the worst that can happen? Safe to fail environments, yes? The other thing with the improv was as well, it, um, it helps to open up collaboration. So improv is actually a really collaborative technique that you've kind of, you've got someone that you're working with and they're gonna help guide you and give you sort of openings and things like that. And it, it, it's quite an interesting slant on it, this, um, this collaboration um, aspect. Okay. Any more questions? We've got a few more minutes. Sorry, I'll repeat the question. Have you got any ideas for games for distributed teams where people aren't in the same location? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, how do, how do you guys feel? Have you, has, has anyone tried to play any games with, with distributed teams? So uh, oh. it's a lot more challenging. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. Um, I mean, I, to be honest, I, I've I've failed when I've tried to do this. I, I think it it would be interesting to to try it. You know, if you're on a VC or something, and you've got a, um, you know, potentially it, it could work. Some of them, but um, I, I've not got much experience of it working effectively. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, the, one of the reasons planning poker works so well is it gets people to share the knowledge. I've got to say, I'm, I'm in the camp of no estimates, estimates are pointless. Estimation, though, is really valuable because it gets all that shared knowledge and it gets people talking about things they might not say otherwise. You know, if you say three points, I say 13 points, we're going to have a chat because I know something you don't and you know something I don't. And at the end of it, everybody hears. So there's value in estimation, but the estimates are pointless. Talk, about, talk to me downstairs about that. I could go on for a, lot, a little while on that. <laughs> but yeah, I think there's a challenge to all of us to come up with games of how to, to do gameplay in a distributed way. And I think perhaps specific games for that would work really well. So I think So Helen was basically saying that if, if, you have, if you're going to run it multi-site, it's useful to have a facilitator in each site. Each site. Thank you. In each site. So you can move forward. But yes. Oh, accidental ones. There you go. So is there any more questions? Sorry, not a, you had one or? When I've done retrospectives distributed, I've done the same thing, get a scrum master on the far side as well as on the near side, so you can replicate the work. But it, it is a lot more difficult to do. It's a lot more challenging environment, but that's true of distributed teams in general. Wow. 
<laughs> what do you use instead? So you learned something extra. They don't have marshmallows in India. And I think on that point, we're probably done unless you have any more questions. But thank you all for your attention. Please do come and talk to us if you want to learn more. And if you want to learn more about Kanban via games, please do come and chat with me later. Cheers.